Okay, so hi, my name is Sebastian Budden. I'm a founding member of Historical Materialism Journal at the book series and the conferences, some of which you would already be familiar with. So I want to just to pitch to you the idea of you uh, subscribing to the journal, firstly. The journal comes out four times a year, published by Brill, over a thousand pages of uh, extremely important and stimulating uh, Marxist theory and Marxist history. Um, we have a discount at the moment for individual subscribers around the time of the, the London conference, and we very strongly uh, both request and uh, demand that you subscribe to the journal, that you uh, get other people to subscribe to the journal, and of course that you get uh, your institution, if you're part of a university or other institution, to subscribe to the journal. We need more subscribers for this project to be able to expand and continue. The second thing I really wanted to push was the book series. Uh, the book series you also probably be familiar with is published by Brill Academic Press, and then the volumes come out 12 months later with A Market Books in Chicago, paperbacks. Um, we have more than 200 volumes published now of translations of original work, of document versions, of uh, translations from uh, Marxist theory from across the world, from Japan to uh, uh, China to um, India to Latin America, very important Latin American list shaping up. In the book series and so on. Um, it's a really crucial intervention in Marxist uh, literature and in, in making Marxist theory available um, that really hasn't existed on this scale since the 1970s. So we'd like you to look at the book series, buy individual volumes, perhaps take up the offer of the book club that Haymarket is, uh, is, is uh, promoting and also of course again if you're part of an institution to get your institution to by as many volumes as possible. Uh, those are the two key elements of our activity, aside from the conferences, the journal and the book series. And we think it would be, uh, well, we think it's essential basically for us, for our existence, for us to be able to continue to thrive for those to expand. So please subscribe to the journal, buy the books and the book series, publicize both around you and help us build the historical materialism project. Thanks. Okay, hello and welcome to this uh, final day of the HM Online Conference. I'm Rob Knox, a member of the HM Editorial Board, and I'll be chairing this panel on Marxism and Imperialism. Uh, so, <laughs> in terms of speakers, I, I think I'll just first say that um, Eduardo, Eduardo Albuquerque couldn't make it today. Um, but the speakers that we do have, well, First up will be Christina Shobel Patel. She's a reader in law at the University of Warwick, and she has a recent book, Marketing Global Justice, which is excellent and you should read. And that will be linked to in the chat. Uh, in principle, Andy Higginbottom and Roberto Veneziani are also meant to be here, <clears throat> yet they have not arrived. So uh, we, we shall see, we shall see. Um, I'm gonna give everyone 20 minutes to speak. And then we'll have time for questions afterwards. But obviously, this depends on who is there. We probably don't want to hear an invisible person give 20 minutes to speech. So we won't do that. Um, but therefore, <clears throat> we will open it up with Christina talking about the international legal life of imperial renting and capitalism. Christina, whenever you're ready. Thank you very much, Rob. Thank you to the organizers in general for. Um uh yeah providing this space a bigger space than i was expecting uh for now but um yeah so i'm going to be talking about volunteer capitalism uh, with a slightly revised title which is new frontiers of extraction the international legal life of imperial volunteer capitalism so a provisional definition of volunteer capitalism that i use is that it's the process by which monopolies for access to scarce resources are created so um, in this, for me, relatively new research project, I show how the term volunteer capitalism, if extended through an imperialist lens, is helpful for making sense of some important features of the global economy and its relationship to international law and climate change. So I look at this from the perspective of Greenland. 
Greenland, I find, offers a fascinating perspective into the struggles that play out under an international and imperial run to a capitalist order. So it's at the center of debates about climate change, the melting ice caps, of course, and extractivism, as well as the ice sheets melt. Um, they are revealing so-called geological riches, making it what is referred to as a new frontier for mineral extraction. At the same time, Greenland is geographically and economically and culturally located in the periphery, but unlike other states in the global south, its struggle for independence and struggles of the indigenous communities are rarely connected to other struggles against imperial power. So I've got five main points that um, I want to make, um, and I'll be emphasizing points two and three. Um, so starting off then with frontier capitalism, if understood in the context of international political economy, is analytically key for pinning down transitions from neoliberalism to monopoly capitalism or the concentration of capital. There's a whole bunch of literature on this, of course, um, but I, I will only briefly allude to that, but I think it's still important to to mention that. Um, then second, frontier capitalism has so far been under theorized when it comes to its contemporary and historical imperial features. So that means an extension to the thinking that's already there, um, extending that to thinking about dominating and dominated states, um, as well as the perspective on the racialization at play. And here um, I refer to the work of Rosa Luxemburg and Samira Amin in particular. Um, and then third, Rante capitalism is often mistaken for something illegal, like it emerges through corruption or it, it somehow exploiting legal loopholes, rather than um, what I would like to emphasize as a legitimized and uh, as legitimized and stabilized through international legal norms and institutions. Um, fourth, it is particularly relevant and timely to consider Rante capitalism um, in the context of extractivism to tackle climate change, of course, timely um, because of all the stuff that has been happening around COP26. But um, what I'm looking at is extractivism around moving from fossil fuels to green energy um, and the attendant marginalization of local or indigenous communities, in particular in, in regards to Greenland, the uh, indigenous Inuit uh, communities. Um, and then both movements against Toronto capitalism um, need to be highlighted. So from indigenous um, uh, uh, social movements to movements like the Berlin housing movement, Deutsches Wohnen und Co. and Eichnen, um, which are movements against Toronto uh, capitalism, resistance against Toronto uh, capitalism. And I um, emphasize that they need to be studied for their ability of scaling them up, scaling up resistance to an international anti-imperialist frame. Okay, so um, I started this, as you will recall, in 2019, um, former US President um, Trump, um, his plans to purchase Greenland from, from Denmark were, were leaked. Um, and uh, this sort of attracted everyone's attention, but mostly this, what was referred to as a real estate deal, um, was sort of met with a lot of ridicule. There were a lot of memes of a um, flashy Trump Tower and uh, the, the territory of Greenland and lots of jokes and so on. Um, and generally, that's how, you know, how the analysis was, too, in a slightly tongue in cheek manner. The Washington Post proceeded to use real estate techniques of valuation to a price on um, Greenland. But the labeling of Greenland as real estate and subsequent pronouncements about Greenland should, I think, and I argue, be taken seriously as symptomatic of an international volunteer capitalist system. So important symptoms of contemporary inter imperial volunteer capitalism are encapsulated here. Um, some of these are the commodification, uh, commodification of Greenlanders' real estate, the rewards, the rents of controlling access to land and its natural resources, continuing imperial structures highlighted through an inter-imperial interaction between the US and Dem Denmark, because the US wanted to buy Greenland off of Denmark, Greenland self-marketization. Um, I'm not going to go into too much depth on that. That's around its own sort of self-understanding through a lens of nation branding. And then the narrative um, uh, uh, imposed on if if anyone was mentioning the indigenous communities at all, then it would be a narrative of 
the indigenous population giving up claims to their land and working for mining companies in order to accumulate sufficient wealth for its self-determination, i.e. Um, independence from Denmark. Um, it has to be said, though, that resistance from um, uh, indigenous groups and the Greenland government have at least for one of these mining projects managed to stall that um, uh, the process. Sorry. Um, so uh, then to the, to the first point, one take capitalism as a move away from neoliberalism. Um, as I said, there's there's lots of um, uh, literature on this and debates um, from from David Harvey to John Smith and so on. But I think it really um, um, is worth mentioning that the members of the Mar um, Pelerin Society, founded in 1947, would have, of course, shuddered at the idea of Bronte capitalism. Right. So whilst trying to harness the powers of the state in favor of capital, they emphasize the importance of competition. So the state had a role in distributing um, access, um, including for, um, through privatization and so on. Um, but that was to steer against monopolization. And what we see through Ronto capitalism is, um, of course, that, that um, monopolization. Now, I'm not, not saying that it's sort of a neat transition from neoliberalism to, to um, monopoly, monopoly capitalism. But there's so, certainly something um, important in, in this point um, at, uh, in time that needs to be um, uh, taken seriously. And of course, then there's sort of that aspect of monopolization. And then there's the, the labor point too, which is crucial here. I'll say some more about this um, uh, in a further point, but um, of course, what's important in terms of labor is the experience exploitation of labor um, for extraction or extractivism and how that um, then relates to Ronto capitalism. Okay, so competition as no longer being completely um, uh, structuring in terms of global political economy. Um, now, the second point on imperial structures of Ronto capitalism, and as, as many others, I'm sure I started off um, with uh, reading Guy Standing, and particularly though Brett Christopher's excellent book, Ronto Capitalism, published by Verso, which um, describes the UK as a Ronto capitalist economy because I'm stripping down the argument, of course, because of the national revenues that come from rent. However, and what I think he misses is something crucial in the analysis, namely the global political economy that props up the system of Ronto capitalism in the UK, and that can then be extended. Um, to a, a, um, a, a global lens. So to misquote um, Walter Johnson on that, for every Manchester, there is a Mississippi. For an understanding of historical and contemporary imperial, what I call imperial frontier capitalism, we must therefore distinguish between those states that dominate and those states that are dominated for the purposes of extracting rent. Um, and Samir Amin call, calls this imperial rent. Um, extractive industries have long, of course, been of interest to analysts of Ronto capitalism, but what is particularly topical right now are the extractive industries for that transition I mentioned away from fossil fuels um, to uh, green technologies and um, what um, uh, Thea Rio Franconis and others have turned green capitalism. Um, and when we look at the Arctic, then um, the rather neglected aspects of Nordic imperialism. So Greenland and the Arctic have, of course, long featured in Western imperial imagination. In the 17th and 18th centuries, Greenland became a stop for European adventurers and colonialists seeking the Northwest Passage and possibilities for settlement. In the 19th century, Greenland was a central location for polar exploration. In the 20th century, the US built strategic military posts here, and today then Greenland considered as this new frontier of mineral extraction. Um, so here, Rosa Luxemburg's conceptualization, conceptualization of primitive accumulation as imperialist expropriation of non-capitalist spheres is, I think, a really useful analytic. So of course, we need to distinguish between different geographies and their integration into, uh, into global capitalism. But in relation to Greenland, it is worth stating that although it has neoliberal ambitions and features as well, uh, particularly as regards its tourist industry, large parts of land in particular are still state owned. So, um, and as I mentioned, 
we need to look at this in regards to labour too. So despite the, the jobs offered for mining and the usual promises of great employment, the mineral mining corporations and investors for green technologies are further rendering the working class superfluous because this is you know, this you know what they're working towards, um, forcing labour power to fall below um, its value, and they're and very much influenced by um, John John Smith's work on super exploitation. Um, imperial run to capitalism then is a condition of what Luxembourg called the battle of capital against the social and economic ties of the natives who are also forcibly robbed of their means of production and labour power. Greenland is understood as this site of primitive accumulation through an inter-imperial rivalry then between Denmark and the US, but if you know from the perspective of mining you can also add China and Australia into the mix as well as uh, the UK. Despite uh, Denmark's reassurance that Greenland belongs to Greenland, which is what the, the Prime Minister of, of Denmark said in, in 2019, when all this came up with Trump, Greenland is, of course, not an independent state, but part of the Kingdom of Denmark, its so-called realm. Um, so that leads me to the third point on international norms and institutions that prop up um, this um, system of Ronte capitalism. When it comes to Ronte capitalism, international law has had a key role in controlling access to um, scarce assets. Um, so i.e. in preventing their redistribution and in legitimizing a, a regime in which imperial rents flow from the periphery to the capitalist metropole. Um, and sort of identifying these legal regimes is at the heart of this research. And I just want to, for the purposes of this talk, highlight two, um, and that's the international re legal regime around um, self-determination and then um, uh, property rights and uh, investment law. So very briefly, self-determination as a regime of international law that maintains rather than disrupts imperial power, um, can be seen in regards to Greenland in particular, um, in an early case at the, what was then the Permanent Court of International Justice, about um, which concerned Denmark's on sovereignty over, over Greenland. Um, and it was a case between Denmark and Norway, because Norway had claimed a part of Eastern Greenland as terra nullius. Now terra nullius, no, no man's land on nobody's land is, um, how this settlement of Australia, for example, was um, legitimized. Um, and um, so Norway had said, because it's terra nullius, ignoring the indigenous people who were already living there, um, it could be acquired by occupation. And then Denmark, who had an interest particularly in the, the, uh, the fishing, uh, uh, exploitation of, of resources um, when it comes to fishing, said claimed that this uh, the sovereignty over this country and the international court of justice um over this territory and the, the international court of justice or then the permanent court of international justice agreed um 60 years later this this issue came back to the then international court of justice the same territory was again under dispute with, and again a dispute between denmark and norway Greenland was not at the table, was not in, uh, included at all. Um, and uh, again, uh, it was decided in favour of Denmark. And um, uh, just quite interesting to read because um, it, the, the case even came to, to the court because of bilateral um, discussions that had um, uh, that had been unsuccessful bilateral, i.e., between Denmark and Norway. So we can see the stabilising there um, of this international system, um, uh, imperial system. Okay, so um, loads more to say there, but I'll move on to um, the second point on private property regimes in international law that legalised Monte capitalism, um, and here in particular. Um, investment regimes. So really important historical work has been done by Brenna Banda, Ona Ulus Inse to, to identify legal orders of propertization. Um, and that includes historically, of course, also licenses that have been handed out from, for mining companies. But, um, so it's important to say that it was in the colonies that new forms of social property relations for profit 
of the Metropole were first conceptualized. So um, 17th century Irish, 18th century North American, 19th century Australian settler colonies were among the laboratories for mapping, classification, surveying and registering land. And there is a, a continuation in what we can see that um, now with contemporary um, uh, uh, liberal investment regimes and the proliferation of risk mitigating investment treaties, right? So risk mitigating for foreign investors. So central to the risk mitigating for investors has been an investor uh, state dispute system um, in which host states have successfully be been sued for environmental or health regulations. Um, that lowers both the costs and risks of um, foreign investment, as I mentioned. Um, so the legacy of property regimes and connecting that back to Brenner Banda's work then, uh, that appropriated indigenous lands and its legal justification of inability to own property or cultivate land depends on ideologies of European racial uh, superiority. Um, at the same time, what's important here in terms of the, the, the possibility of international law stabilizing this system is that the, the, in international law, the tension between um, colliding different regimes is overemphasized. So while investment laws tend to protect foreign investors, including of course threats of justiciable compensation for profit losses, claims in the billions, on the other hand, there are also human rights um, regimes which aim to um, uh, protect um, uh, um, those fighting um, uh, against this, including, of course, uh, indigenous peoples, small scale producers and so on. But that tension is really overemphasized in international law because disputes simply tend to be resolved in favor of capital. Uh, and there's, there's, of course, an empirical argument to be made there. Um, now, that leads me to um, uh, um, the fourth point, which is quite brief on the promises of a, a capital accumulation, like what is actually going on in Greenland um, and the markets of green technologies um, there. So when the Washington Post put did this valuation of Greenland and the higher estimation of the value, they sort of looked different ways of valuation and the higher estimation was based on expected returns due to global warming of Greenland literally becoming greener. So as well as the movement of populations then to the Arctic due to increased inhabitability of large parts of the world. Um, China has to date had a near monopoly on the minerals, like the rare earth minerals that required for, um, uh, for green technologies. But the realization that Greenland could be a rival supplier has set off what has been termed a modern gold rush. So some of the mining companies operating or investing in Greenland um, are um, well, <laughs> the names say all oh, China, Nordic Mining, London Mining, Greenland. Um, and then in August this year, Cobalt uh, Metals, a Californian company backed by who else uh, <laughs> other than Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos, joined um, formed a joint venture with Blue Jay Mining, a British company to search for minerals in, in Greenland using artificial intelligence to pinpoint deposits. Um, so I mentioned earlier that there has been some successful resistance, um, and this is to the Australian company Greenland Minerals, um, which is developing a large scale mining project, uh, the so-called Kiana Feld um, Rare Earth Project. Um, and here, um, other than the um, these rare earth minerals, it's also uranium, zinc and fluorous bar um, that have been named as deposits there. And the company, of course, emphasizes um, that mining will be for, for green purposes, uh, but uranium in particular is known for its long-term adverse effects on health and the environment um, where it is mined. So that brings me to my final point on resistance. Um, and in 2021, the unease with extractive industries actually led to an election in Greenland um, and um, uh, and, and that's meant that at least the licenses which um, the processes by which these licenses um, are given to um, this company Greenland Min Minerals, um, those have stalled. But as you can imagine, Greenland Minerals continues to press ahead um, with its objective of attaining the necessary licenses. And if, if you want to, you know, if you want to get really worked up, then um, read some of those 
um, uh, documents um, uh, uh, drafted by Greenland minerals and their threats um, to um, Greenland saying that they will no longer be attractive for investment if they don't let Greenland mi minerals um, uh, pursue this this project and so on. Um, and, you know, Rosa Luxemburg would have really uh, labelled this um, a battle um, of annihilation. So resistance to Ronte capitalism largely remained localised, but the strength of these movements is, is growing. And here I think is really important then following on from a, um, other work done by, by uh, Rosa Luxemburg on strategy and tactics to think about how uh, these movements can be connected. So this means not only studying um, indigenous resistance, um, social movements, but also, uh, as I mentioned before, the housing market, uh, the housing movements um, in, in Spain, in Germany, in, in many other countries. The one that's attracted my attention um, is, is in particular the Berlin housing movement not only because it had significant success in the September elections, but also because the legal, legal perspective um, was tactically engaged here. Um, and um, yeah, so um, a, a means of, of creating links um, between uh, resistance movements, scaling them up as um, anti-imperialist movements. Um, so to conclude then, imperial rente capitalism is a way of describing the global structures that enable rental extraction from the monopolistic or sometimes also oligopolistic control over scarce assets that can be um, all sorts of resources, but in particular land uh, and natural resources with a particular view to the state's role in enabling this extraction and transfer from the peripheries to the capitalist metropole. So uh, that's it. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to any, any questions that, that you might have. Great. Thanks, Christina. <clears throat> that was um, really good. I don't think I will have many, many questions. Uh, okay, Andy Higginbottom is now in the room. So Andy, if you want to just go, uh, you've got 20 minutes um, whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you very much. I do apologise to all concerned about my lateness of uh, arrival. It was a diary error on my part. Um, so now I want to share my screen. Can you see my screen? Okay. Um, so this is about um, the relationship between uh, Middle East oil and state formation in the Middle East and state formation in Britain. So I took the sort of overall title for the conference quite uh, seriously and I thought I'd start off with a bang. Um, so this is a very, this is taken from a very excellent series of articles written uh, by UK Declassified, there's about nine articles in all, where they detail, uh, really do detail the links between the royal family of the UK and the various um, monarchies in the Gulf, uh, Saudi Arabia. And so I thought Charles could give us a big kickoff, um, which does, uh, you know, really show the stupidity of him claiming to be ecological uh, just after COP26 has really uh, failed. Uh, but it's also about how the connection shapes uh, the state form in Britain, as well as in Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states. That's what I'm interested in looking at. And in some respects, I'm responding uh, to a, a recent article by Adam Hanier, actually two articles, in which he says the notion of a rentier state, he basically critiques it and says it doesn't look at class relations, uh, and in particular class struggles inside those states. And what I'm actually arguing is um, different to that position. I think the notion of a rentier state is extremely important in understanding these relations. Again, not only in the Middle East, but in Britain. In other words, the relation between the two is very important. And in particular, what I'm gonna concentrate on today, just because of time, is what is the rent of the rentier state? I mean, what is rent? And in particular, I'll be looking at oil rents, but just to give you uh, some couple of reminders of the sort of salience pertinence of this topic, you can see how Saudi Arabia uh, 
Sovereign Wealth Fund PIF has taken over a cost of about 300 million pounds, Newcastle United Football Club. Uh, so we don't need to be reminded how important this connection is. And furthermore, um, it's been a major discussion point, both under Trump and uh, under Biden, how, how the US and Britain actually tried to influence Saudi Arabia's, in particular Saudi Arabia's production policy for oil, because what, uh, how much Saudi Arabia produces affects the entire global oil market. So it's a, it's a big issue about the sort of the dynamics of global oil and energy supplies and what that means in terms of the relations between the US and the British state and the producers of oil in the Middle East. Okay, so behind all of this, I'm going to go right back to Marx's theory of rent. And really, this is the sort of the, the starting point of uh, my argument. This uh, is a diagrammatic representation of something which comes direct out of volume three of Capital. And uh, if you can see on the right hand side, you've got a, a producer on a type of land which is the least fertile. This is agriculture, uh, land type A, and then you have slightly more fertile land type B, more fertile again, land type C, and the most fertile land in production, land type D. And Mark sets up a sort of a scenario of different capitals being applied in agriculture to the land and producing wheat. So more wheat is produced through a given investment of capital on land type D. It's four times more fertile, basically. So the unit of wheat is uh, four times cheaper to produce. Now, Marx's concept of uh, being cheaper to produce is the price of production. The price of production on, say, we, we take this one, land type B, is uh, £1.50. And of that price of production, um, something like 25 pence he will say is profit this is this sort of amber bit here and one pound 25 is the cost of production so what you have is a similar quantities of profit on each type of land but it's just cheaper to produce on the more fertile land which means that the price of production is the cost price plus the profit and the price of production on d is lower than on c which is lower on b and lower on an a OK, you might think this is very old fashioned and very technical, uh, but actually it's extremely relevant, this type of conceptualization of a commodity market under conditions where capital operates with different degrees of fertility drawn from nature, or to put it another way, with more and more favorable conditions. And to put it another way again, with the labor which is employed by capital being more and more productive because of the conditions under which it's producing. So in other words, the labor employed by capital on land type D is actually producing four times as many use values as the labor employed on land type A. Not because it's any more skilled or because it's any more um, necessarily had any more capital invested, but because it's producing more use values, it's producing more wheat in this case. Okay, and that's the basis, it's, it's the way in which capital appropriates the uh, wealth of nature by making labor more productive. So there's a third actor in this. So I've talked about the active capitalists and I've talked about labor. The third actor in this is the, the actor which captures the surplus profit. Now, the selling price in this case, the regulating price in the market in Marx's example would be three pounds per unit a week, because this is the least efficient producer at which uh, wheat is being sold. But of course, we can see that at that price, all the other producers are going to make an extra profit over and above their price of reduction. This is the so-called surplus profit. Now, all of this is absolutely fundamental to understanding the, the global energy economy today. So what we have then is three ingredients in terms of uh, revenue from the wheat that's sold. We have surplus profit, we have profit, and we have replacing the cost of production. Okay, so um, there's one more thing that I want, to, before I leave this diagram, there's one more thing that I want to... Uh, sort of rehearse because it is actually important in a contemporary sense, which is what would happen 
if the producers on this land, the most fertile land, decided to increase their production. In other words, rather than producing four units, they produced five units. Well, if the overall production would stay the same, 10 units in volume, then they would squeeze this producer out of production. It would not be possible for this producer to sell their products because the actual regulating price would fall. And in this example, it would fall quite dramatically. It would actually half uh, to, to this would become the least productive producer in production. And that would assume, of course, that the 10 units at £1.50, uh, there'd be no sort of increased uh, sale because of a lower price. It's not quite, so it's not quite as simple as this, but it begs the question, what is it uh, that this producer wants to do? If they want to maximize their surplus profit, then at some point they may consider increasing or decreasing production, depending on the effect it has on producers on the rest of the curve. So in the case that I've outlined, it wouldn't make sense in a rational sort of economic actor sense for these producers to increase their production because falling price down to £1.50 even though they've increased production would actually reduce their total surplus profit. Okay. So that's why, even though they're the cheapest producer, they won't necessarily increase production, right? Because it will actually decrease their surplus profit. They want a high price. But on the other hand, if they increase production to somewhere about here, then they'd actually end up making more surplus profit than they originally did. Right. So there's an awful lot of calculation an estimation of the effect of changing the volume production of these producers, what effect it will have on the overall market volume and their share within the market. And this is a very dynamic factor. It, and it, it builds into this type of market an inbuilt volatility. Um, it's, it, it's very hard to predict. Based on the law of value, it's very hard to predict price oscillation. Um, now, I'm just basically summarizing all this here. And the other thing about the example that I've worked through is that what Marx is actually looking at is a sort of a, not exactly an ideal type, but it's a, he's, he's treating the class relations in a very specific way. He's treating the class relations in agriculture in England in the mid 19th century as what he calls the classic example. Right. There are really important points about Marx's theory of rent. The outer form of his categories are no different to bourgeois categories of rent. I mean, you know, they know about rent. Landowners take rent off capitalists who fight with landowners about how much rent they're going to pay them. The difference is the internal connection through which Marx explains the outer forms of rent as surplus profit. And he bases his theory of rent on a labor theory. In other words, the source of the surplus profit is an extra surplus value produced by more productive labor employed by capital. So what Marx does is he combines labor exploitation with the expropriation of specific conditions of nature. So it's a very synthetic theoretical articulation. Now, one of the big issues about Marx's example is that he basically says the landowner gets all of the surplus profit. And this is based on a particular class relation where the uh, farmers, the capitalist farmers, on one year leases. So if they improve the land in any way, basically it makes the land more valuable and the, the landowner can rent out the land the next year at a higher price. So it's a particular articulation of these fundamentally necessary class relations. So what Marx is arguing is that surplus profit is necessary. It's an absolute and indispensable condition of the capitalist mode of production, the way capital appropriates nature. He's further arguing that the way surplus profit is divided is based on the property right of land ownership. And he gives a particular articulation of that, as I've said. Right? So you surplus profit is non-negotiable in Marx's theoretical schema. What is more contingent is how it's distributed, okay? 
Now, remember that diagram I showed you earlier? Well, have a look at this. This is a standard uh, oil consultancy, an awful lot of consultancies around the world spend a lot of money on this and take a lot of money on information about which way the energy markets are moving. And this is one of the major consultancies. And what they're projecting here is towards 2040, where will new production of oil be in the world? And what you can see is something very remarkably similar to the type of diagram I showed you earlier. I mean, it's almost point for point the same. It's just a slightly less schematic, it might, it's less simplified. But the actual content in terms of the form of the world oil industry today is almost exactly the same as Marx presented agriculture in the mid 19th century. The break even price, uh, BEP, that is, is, is normally used in these cost production curves is actually exactly the same, different name, same concept as price of production. And what they're using this for to say, and this allows uh, sort of forward bets on the price of oil, is it's likely that uh, almost all the future projects, 90% of them, are able to continue producing at less than $50 a barrel. So oil is going to continue either to be cheap and or a source of significant surplus profits in the coming period. At the moment, it's selling at $85 a barrel. So you can see, I mean, in the average uh, cost of the uh, break even point, rather, in the Middle East is $22 a barrel. It's actually lower than that at the moment. But you can see at $85 a barrel how much surplus profit is being made from oil production in the Middle East. It's something like $60. Three quarters of the uh, price of a barrel of oil is surplus profit, which is profit over and above average profits, normal rates of profit. Okay, so these are quite stupendous figures. Uh, just by the way, the other two reference points which this uh, brief survey highlights is the cost of the offshore oil in Guyana, which is the cheapest of the offshore generation. And Exxon are plowing loads of money in, into this project, massively risky, massively potentially environmentally destructive, but you can see the profit incentive is there. And finally, uh, shale production, which is US Permian, also known as tight oil, is at the higher end of the product, uh, the, the, um, the fields who are currently in production. Okay, so going back, if you remember our example, the lowest cost producer, in a sense, has got control over shale oil in the US, right? If they increase their production at $20 a barrel, they can drive US production out. They can actually force it out to production. And so it's a very um, sort of dynamic power relationship is also involved here. Why would a Saudi oil producer want to drive US oil producers out of production? Well, they could be tempted if they can make an awful lot more money out of it. Okay. Um, now, this is a really important source um, of the sources. I mean, I haven't time to review all the theory, theory of oil rents. I think he's probably the most important writer I've come across uh, from Iran, writing in, mostly in German. And this is from 1984. And what he's showing is in the case of oil, it's not only about oil, because oil actually competes with other sources of heat. Um, and the, the main competitor at that time was um, coal. So he, what he's arguing, I think it's quite right to argue, is it's not so much an oil market, it's an energy market, especially if you look at a production of electricity and so on. So what you get is a further premium on the price of oil until it reaches the point at which it's actually competing with coal and other sources of energy. Okay, so he's pointing out, I mean, the first, this part of the graph is very much what I've been showing you already, uh, cheap oil producer, higher cost oil producer, UK was significant at the time. They, even the higher cost producer of crude oil can make a surplus profit because they're actually competing with coal, which is more expensive to produce again. Okay, so it's an energy market. So this means that almost all oil producers can look forward to some kind of generating surplus profit until the price reaches the price of coal. This is another uh, graph from Maserat. Um, now, who gets the surplus profit? Well, in Marx's agricultural scenario, 
it was the the landowner that managed to capture all the surplus profit from the tenant farmer but that's not the case with oil and what you see here is you can all see the history of the 20th century in in the relation underpinning it in terms of who captures the surplus profit so uh, what Maserat does here quite rightly in my opinion you see divides the surplus profit into three categories there's actually a fourth category which has emerged since by the way but these three categories are the ground rent which will be taken by the owner of the land on which the oil from which the oil is being extracted which is normally the state in the case of the middle east and then you have the company profits and the company profits are actually multinational corporations and then actually company extra profits so you can see here over and above the average rate of profit we have a category company profits and then we have a third category which is completely overlooked in most of the literature which is the extent to which the surplus profits from oil were taken by the receiving state in other words the importers of oil put excise duties in the case of the uk known as excise duties on oil products so that there's to and that brings them up into a more competitive position with other sources of energy okay so what you can see here is two break points in the graph on around about 1960 when there was a kind of like a shift from what i'd call a general pattern of sort of semi-colonial relations to a pattern which is more like neo-colonial but what you can see here is in this period the division is still kind of like 80 20 in favor of the imperialist countries whether they're the corporations or the states importing right 80 20 in favor of the imperialist centers rather than the producing countries now there was a big shift as a result of opec in the mid 1970s but even after this shift right well basically the opec nation said we are the landowners we want our share of the surplus profits okay but even after this big shift over 50 percent of the surplus profit was still being taken by the imperialist countries rather than by the oil producing countries okay so you can see as a sort of like a financial basis for an alliance on the one hand but a degree of competition on the other in in this relation and this last one is just to sort of point out this is perhaps an unusual and un unexpected source the royal automobile uh, corporation but these are these are the levels of tax in the uk on uh, petrol pump prices of diesel and petroleum normal petrol we call it and what you can see i think it's pretty clear i hope you can see it is this is a, this is about 60 or 70 percent of what the final consumer pays for oil is actually taken by the british state as tax and uh, the chancellor exchequer said very recently well one of the big problems of going off oil is we're going to lose 20 billion you know that don't you right so this is how much the, U the UK exchequer takes from these taxes. It's something I think something on the order of 20 billion a year. Okay, this is this is taking out a part of the surplus profit generated by the incredible cheapness of oil production. Okay, so I've run out of time and I do apologize for being late. There's an awful lot more I, I, I could develop from this, but time is, is against us, right? What this means is um, there's quite a lot of very good recent scholarship about class relations in the oil producing states. And the further category, which I haven't, uh, you know, going beyond the Maserat's analysis, because it's a more contemporary development, is part of the surplus profit from oil is distributed directly by the producing state to their citizens, not to their immigrant workers, but to their citizens in the form of subsidized uh, electricity. And so what you have is quite privileged air conditioned societies around the Gulf and in Saudi Arabia, which are actually taking a, a, a part of that surplus profit and decommodifying it in a sense, right? And making it available as a use value to generate, to create both water and electricity and this is uh, one one right he's called these uh, energy kingdoms and it's a nice combination between energy uh, and uh, sort of the, the state structure if you like based on 
based on it. And the other really important uh, work, which I would only summarize if I had more time anyway, because it, I mean, I don't have greater knowledge than the, the author is called uh, Anglo Arabia by David Waring. And it's a very good book because what he traces is all the different ways in which the UK benefits from the profit, profitability of oil production, including arms trade, financial center, redistribution of assets to the UK, Newcastle United Football Club, for example, uh, and so on. And so what I'm trying to do is uh, take those current forms of financial flows uh, and un uh, connect it more, if you like, ground it more fully in the uh, critical political economy of oil production and following the money from production through to circulation and its distribution and how it affects each state or each type of state and their interrelationship. That's me. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Andy. Um, if you could uh, stop sharing the screen, that screen now, that'd be good. Um, I don't think that Roberto is making it. So I think what we will do is move to questions. I suspect the session will finish early unless people are really, really keen on even more questions, but I think we could get some, some good questions going. So I'll just remind people um, in general that if they want have any questions or comments, please just write them in the, in the YouTube uh, comments there. I think we've already got some, so I'll just read some of them out now and I'll pop my own question in as well. So I think maybe specifically directed at Christina, although Andy come in say it too, but it was before you came. Um, someone was asking, well, is the market a monopoly? So Amazon, eBay, Uber, Alphabet, et cetera, like to what degree can we consider them a monopoly? Um, someone asked, again, I think for Christina, like, um, is the Donton case in the US an example of the particular kind of tension that you were talking about there? Uh, I had a question via WhatsApp from uh, Richard Kumar for you, Christina, which I'll put in the chat as well. But basically a question about, well, can international law be a site for people to resist or contest the, the struggle, like, the process of rentier capitalism? And is it just simply social movements and uh, political struggle that's the only example? Uh, I wanted to ask a little bit of a follow-up question about linking together the things you were saying about inter-imperialist rivalry and wanting capitalism. And to say, do you think that also international legal institutions might reflect not necessarily the struggles between subaltern and dominating states, but also between different imperial states who may have more or less interest in the promotion of Montier states and Montier capitalism. Because at least any given instance, you could imagine that some states are more interested in opening things up and because they can't get a foothold in that way. And so is there any of that interplay in the way international and legal institutions work? Andy, one thing I wanted you to, I wondered if you would mind expanding on, and it's towards what you're saying at the end, but I think it's worth rehashing. And I know you'll have this question a lot of variants at various points, but I think I think for a lot of people, the question is not just what are the implications for, say, class composition in oil producing states, but also what do you think of the implications for class struggle in that way and how that ends up playing out on a, on a global scale? So not just a vulgar question of like, oh, what does that, that mean can be done? But I wonder if you could say a little bit about how the particular character of um, Ronte capitalism you're talking about affects the way in which class struggles play out in different contexts and what the kind of content of those is and how that works. I think that's something that a lot of people always wonder in the context of thinking about this stuff. So I'd really be interested in you expanding a little bit on that. Um, Christina, are you okay to start? Or, I mean, we're just going to be order. <laughs> you gave me a look there. <laughs> um. <clears throat> Can I start with the Dontiger case? Because I'm not, I'm not, a, I, I'm definitely not a specialist on it. Um, but it is actually exactly indicative of what I think is going on. Um, so this is, I, I hope this is the same one uh, that uh, uh, Santo is refer, referring to. Um, so um, this is Chevron. Um, and uh, Ecuador, so Ecuador claiming that um, 
uh, Chevron has been polluting um, and so on. And um, the the Ecuadorian courts, they found um, sh um, that Chevron had, um, uh, or th they decided that Chevron needed to pay um, uh, reparations, so found against Chevron and then, um, uh, and then it's quite interesting if you go on 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 Chevron's um, website how they sort of explain what's happened, um, because they call this obviously a smear campaign against them and so on. Um, but what what is interesting from the perspective of international law is that and thinking about how do these actors um, where where do they see a a, um, a uh, a, a forum for themselves that will um, uh, uh, that will basically you know back up their interests. So what Chevron did then was that it went to the Hague and um, started um, uh, arbitration against Ecuador um, under um, the the arbitration systems that are there. So so uh, once. Nash, a national jurisdiction had found against it. It thought, well, maybe the international legal sphere will 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 be helpful, right? And they were right because um, the um, arbitrators in the Hague they found in favour of um, uh, of Chevron, and actually they took on board this whole narrative about the fraudulent case that this had come by through, um, and you know, um, uh, Don Segura is the, the lawyer there and that the, he had acquired uh, information through for, uh, fraudulent means and that Chevron wasn't actually even acting in Ecuador and so on. So it's actually a really good, good example of how international law is stabilizing this system um, in favour of, of, of Rontiers. Um, and I guess that then sort of also responds to um, the question about where I see international law in this. Um, so um, uh, along with Rob, I'd probably say international law is not going to save us, right? Um, but then I do think that when it comes, I, I was sort of just emphasizing that last point that I, I was making, I think that we can, again, turn to Rosa Luxemburg in this and think about strategy and tactics. Um, and I do think that international legal norms and institutions can be not on their own, but with the the relevant polit political um, force ca can be turned against these systems in particular tactical ways. Um, and that's why I fi find the um, Berlin um, housing mo movement so fascinating, because they said, look, the constitution, the German constitution, um, says that you can expropriate um, uh, uh, landowners and and that means redistribution, right? So it's something that they had picked up on in the German constitution that had been completely neglected. You know, I studied law in, in Germany, never really paid any attention to, to this article. But it, it was really effective and it was really effective in the narrative also in 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 um, in creating um, uh, in, in creating a mass political movement in, in Berlin, which was um, which was then successful. So, um, yeah, and I think it's all about uh finding how that that th those can interconnect when can you use international laws um powerful narrative um against it itself um yeah so that was rob i forgot your question <laughs> sorry <laughs> well it was just um to what degree do you also see let's say that there is a tension and it may be a tactical tension between different imperialist blocks and their relation at a given point, not just to specific Rontiers, but also to like the notion of the Rontier being protected. Because as a strategy of accumulation, there may be moments in which some imperial states do not want some other states right. to be operating in frontier ways. And to what degree do you think part of international law is also mediating that dynamic? And depending on who's saying what and in what context. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you're absolutely right. It, 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 in a way, you, you know, you have to... 
you have to sort of make that question more specific to a particular context. So is it, <laughs> it are you asking specifically about Greenland um, and Denmark and, and the US and like the different inter-imperial rivalries? Or are you asking that, sorry to bounce that back to you, Rob. I'm asking you in whatever way you find it least obnoxious because that would be an easy way of doing it. Um, I was thinking also generally, but I think in the specific context, text of just like or even like do you think that Greenland might be then a very specific example of it being one way but it could be arranged elsewhere in other contexts maybe yeah so when it <laughs> when it comes to um I, I, I have to make it more specific yeah when it comes to mineral mining I do think that um uh it is about um uh about well, the, whole, the the rivalry is about creating this the access, right? And, and that's where and that's where um, and that's where then Denmark, the US, China, Australia, and so on. That's where where they are competing. Um, but I think that. I think that the analytic of understanding this is as as competition, which is, I think, where you're going, Rob. <laughs> um, I think that's the, the 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 less useful part of understanding what's going on. Does that make sense? Um, so, because I don't think that the 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 the, the analytic of competition that was so and this brings me back to that that very first point that was so key to understanding neoliberalism and its structures um, is what really um, um, highlights what is what is going on globally. I'm going to leave it. At that. <laughs> otherwise I'm gonna I'm gonna spin out of uh, out of the argument <laughs> I've just um, come in on that actually if that's okay the um there's a line in Lenin's imperialism in the highest stage of capitalism where he just very briefly characterizes the difference between Germany France and the UK and he you know this is not um new uh, to us right but he characterizes France as usury uh, he characterizes Germany as manufacturing and the UK, I can't remember what term he gives, right? But I think I would say it's particularly rentier. And there's a whole sort of um, a tradition of uh, business studies where they look at the, the types of projects that foreign investment uh, generates from different centers. And the type of project that Britain generates compared to Germany is probably too you know, towards the two ends of the spectrum. So it's not that Britain exports manufacturing industries uh, elsewhere in the world. What it does is it sets up railway companies and mining companies and oil companies. Okay, so Britain has got a very strong profile in these extractive industries. If you look at who, what the biggest corporations in the UK are after the banking sector, it's super majors in oil and mining. Uh, the, you know, the top 20, you've got five big corporations in, in these sectors. So they're really at the heart of the British ruling class. And they've been at the heart of British state strategy ever since Winston Churchill and probably before, you know. So it, the, the, the sort of the, the variations of the type of uh, imperial power is quite important in terms of state form and in terms of, you know, recourse to the law to defend, I would say, uh, these sort of super profits or surplus profits. So it, it's not a, a full answer to your question, but there's another sort of very interesting angle. There was an earlier session in, in the uh, conference, which I thought, it, from my point of view, my research interest was extremely productive. And what um, the colleague was doing is he's trying to unite um, the type of work which you probably know already, which uh, David White's doing on state corporate crime and his book Ecocide. And what he's looking at is he coins a term, well, he's actually taken it from Nkrumah, right? Neocolonialism. But what he does is a, is, is a good twist on it, a fresh take, right? Which is he's saying that the neocolonial relationship is ecological destruction. It's the key relationship in destroying the planet is the neo-colonial one. The damage is done elsewhere and the profits are shared. A large portion of them come overseas because it gives a degree of impunity 
to one of the major beneficiaries of ecological destruction. Um, so I think he's onto something very big. Now, there is a weakness in the cr critical criminology literature, which is they tend to write about state corporate crime and maybe their intersection, their overlap, right? But it is a fair criticism to say that class is diminished in, in this sort of way of setting up the issue, right? And um, so you can't just follow the money. You have to integrate it with the question, the social relations of class. And then I come, I, and that's from above and from below. And so I come on to the class struggle in the Middle East, which I don't know a lot about. Uh, but I mean, I, there are some really important points that have, should be stated, right? I mean, the first is that, you know, the, these states were based on counter revolutions. I mean, they were based on defeating popular class struggles. I mean, at the moment of transition or potential transition to independence, the Fanonian moment, I mean, all the negatives that Fanon predicted were writ large in, in the Gulf area, in the Middle East. OK, so Saudi Arabia, what's that? It's, just, it's like Winds of Britain. It's, it's a country named after a, a royal dynasty. Right. So what you have is. The US intervened absolutely critically in the UK to make sure the direction of Saudi Arabia was conservative and authoritarian. So in Vitalis's book, he documents very well, there were both Saudi and immigrant worker strikes in Aramco in the early 1950s, two major strikes, and they were destroyed. Uh, and you know, sort of the conservative wing got state power. And the, the key actors of the intervention were the US military, Aramco, and the reactionary wing of the Saudi family. And so, you know, the, the class struggle, that was kind of like a pivotal moment there, because the class struggle was defeated. And what you have is a, a deeply conservative reactionary regime, which is completely supported by the major imperial powers to this day. And then you have... Um, you know, arguably the big class struggle in Iran, which was the, you know, a progressive revolutionary, not revolutionary, but progressive social democratic government, Mossadegh was defeated. And you have today the class struggles in the Gulf states. And here I completely agree, for example, with what Adam Hanier writes about this, I think he's completely spot on about it, is, is the role of the immigrant worker. It, 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 I mean, the workers, the real workers in most of these states are immigrants. I mean, there's hardly any workers, if you like, of national origin. And, and so the class struggle is, is completely based on the kafala system and the fight to destroy it, as, as we'll see with World Cup and Qatar. But um, so, yeah, so the super profits have been diverted or shared to such a degree that many uh, parts of the um, oil producing society have risen above any kind of productive activity. I mean, they are privileged. They, they live in a very privileged situation and, and all the real work is being done by contract laborers under very harsh conditions of super exploitation. So it's extremely racialized, you know, and uh, you know, that's built into the system. It's not an externality. That is what the system is. It's an extreme racial hierarchy in the production of the world's oil and most other raw materials as well, actually. Great, thanks both of you, because they were really good answers. Okay, I'm going to see if we have any more questions in the comments. I mean, we've had another question about um, the implications for what both of these mean about class struggle in the global north and the, the revolutionary potentiality of the working class in the global north. I don't know if people want to come in on that i mean i think the answer is not that much on the basis of both of these but um <clears throat> nonetheless we could uh, we could have a little discussion about that so i don't know if anyone wants to come in on that and then i'll see if anything else comes up but you know time is running out it's a deep problem i just checked in in the link i mean i actually grew up supporting newcastle united football club I, you know what am i going to do i mean it's it's you know it's loyalism. It's it, it, it's wedding uh, support to a club, to a completely reactionary project, uh, with you know it's sort of yeah, um, lost for words almost, right? I mean you know it's desperate, but it has to has to be has to be fought, has to be dealt with in terms of political class struggle here, um, and then, and there's one easy point that shouldn't be um, what's the word that shouldn't be um, forgotten. 
which is this whole projection. I mean, I, even the photos that I showed, right, of, you know, making fun of the Saudis or something like that. I mean, there's a whole discussion apparently about whether or not it, would t it wasn't meant to be offensive. I generally think they weren't trying to be offensive. They were actually on the opposite. They were welcoming the money and therefore trying to show their gratitude. But it's in either way, it's a completely sort of, you know, where's the class struggle in that? I mean, there isn't. <laughs> Zida, do you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> um, no, I'll, I'll, I'll... yeah, <laughs> I do. <laughs> but I don't know whether they're productive for our for our discussion. Um, um, I mean. I mean, I think that I think what happens is that in analysing Ronte capitalism, class struggle is often left out there because it's often the labour aspect. That's what I was trying to say, the labour aspect that is neglected in the analysis, right? Because it's all about this idea that you, you just need to own something and then the, the rents will come in, right? And that sort of neglects then... The labour aspect. Um, and so I think bringing the labour aspect into Ronte capitalism is absolutely key. Um, and that then also that enables um, the, the question of um, class struggle, because uh, otherwise Ronte capitalism only seen from the perspective of the Ronte is, is, uh, um, uh, is a, a truncated analysis of what's happening yeah that's very good i agree with that yeah i think that that makes perfect sense okay i do not see any more um <clears throat> comments being made here we've had a smaller panel anyway so you know we're actually running about where we would run if we had it in an extra 20 minutes or so so I think if anyone wants to make any closing words, you can. Otherwise, uh, people can have lunch. I agree with what Christine's saying. I mean, the problem is, uh, it is the Lenin problem. I, I'm sorry, but I don't want to be too um, Lenin versus Luxembourg, right? But I mean, the question of the, the use of uh, these surplus profits does affect class struggle. It affects, uh, you know, sections of the working class and how, how they relate in terms of their overall loyalty, belief in the system or not. I mean, look at the sort of, I mean, the Gulf states are an extreme because I don't think there are hardly any, if you like, in also with indigenous uh, workers. I mean, all the working class is immigrant, right? It, it's privileged to that degree. Now, we're not talking about that type of privilege in Britain, but I mean, the very fact that people can turn their backs on, you know, bombing of Yemen, and uh, people being hanged and so on because it's their local football club. I mean, this is this is privilege, you know. I mean, you can't deny it. It, it, it shapes the contours of the class struggle and the class struggle, you know, agency is within this kind of sort of framing uh, of loyalties being bought and people being paid off in one way or another. And I think that, you know, one can't assume can't assume, therefore, a unity of the class struggle. There's really big challenges. I mean, it is right to appeal to working class unity, um, uh, but I mean, it, it's not necessarily uh, the uh, the appeal may or may not be successful. And you have to ask the question: Well, why isn't it being successful? Why isn't it enough for people to know that Saudi Arabia, with RAF planes and you know British weapons and so on, it, it, it is bombing? Uh, people in Yemen on a daily basis. What, why isn't that enough for people to to care? And you know, if you're a materialist, you have to well say, well, I'm, you know, there is some degree of buying off has been going on through these massive, um, you know, e extra money floating around. And I, I think, think my, yeah, sorry, I think my my final point on that would be when it comes to the moving away from fossil fuels to green technology it's not just the buying it's not just the buying off of um i think it's also 
the 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 sort of comfort in thinking someone else is dealing right this is not a class struggle question this 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 is someone else is dealing with the problem right this is all the the discussion about tech fixes and so on that you can say well, perhaps this is something <laughs> an area where you, you don't need to um engage class struggle but that's that's sort of yeah that's precisely um the 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 problem with you know what's been termed then green capitalism um yeah yeah because i mean i'll just say something about because obviously the question you would ask is in what material conditions would that be a thinkable thing there are lots of people who cannot <laughs> think that because they understand the conditions they're in that's not that's not a way of thinking that's available to them it's not a realistic thing so it's like well where do people think that it tends to be in places that are pretty high up in the international division of labor where they can think they can rely on this and where also importantly they know that certain forms of technological fixes which will wreck elsewhere in terms of lithium mining or whatever will mm -hmm. not be wrecking them so i think that's that's, that's that, that is absolutely right what you're saying but of course i think that is back into this question about just like in forms of imperial distribution and i think on this happy note, let's uh, <laughs> let's close the session. Thanks to both of you for great papers. Um, I think we still made it work with the two of us. I think we had a pretty productive exchange and conversation, and I look forward to reading what both of you have, have written. Um, and so, yeah, I think we'll we'll just we'll, we'll finish early, but again, with the proviso that it's twenty minutes extra that was meant to be in here. And uh, so, thanks everyone for coming. Enjoy the rest of this final day of HM and make sure you stick around for everything, including, including our final sessions. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye, everyone.